I have no idea why God decided to tie his great work in the world to leaders. The God who creates and the God who does and the God who has no need of anything somehow motioned and said, come with me, kid. I'm going to involve you. And leadership has been a part of what God always does, and it's surprising. I go back to the book of Judges, and I see how broken the world is and how broken God's people are. And I wonder, God, what are you going to do? And God winks and says, watch this. And you watch as he raises up at the first, first Samuel, and he raises up Samuel. And Samuel becomes this leader that God uses to advance the kingdom. You find that over and over again. It'll be a shepherd boy God raises up. It'll, it'll be Elijah and Elisha that God raises up. Christ himself comes in the flesh, and he'll raise the dead, and, and he'll do the incredible things with lepers and the healing but he takes three and a half years to wrap around him a set of guys and say, come on. And he begins to make them leaders. He begins to say things like, come with me that I might send you out. And he says things to them like, you go into all the world and I'll meet you there. This concept of leadership is woven through Scripture. When I come to Acts or Romans or Corinthians, it doesn't matter any of the books that I read. Consistently, leadership is the core of what God is doing. The church at Corinth, it, it, it's struggling. And what it struggles over is a corrupted leadership. And so what Paul tries to do is restore leadership because without leadership, God has not chosen to advance the kingdom the ways that he will with leadership. And so in this series, let's talk about kingdom leadership. It is an incredible thing that, that you've been invited, I think, to be a part of. When you consider it, you need to know that when you become a kingdom biblical leadership, that little girl who lives in the trailer house and a trailer park at the corner of town, you're going to be somebody who changed her whole life and future. A young married couple who, who are going to experience the hand of God in their life, there's a very good chance that your call to leadership is part of what God partners with to bring that about. When lost people come to know him, when hell is emptier and heaven is fuller, It'll be because this partnership that God chose of I will do my work with leaders. But when we talk about leadership, one of the key things we've got to figure out is what did he mean? What is kingdom leadership? Well, from my, my world view, from my study of Scripture, I've come to a pretty strong conclusion. I think there are three models of leadership that exist in this culture, uh, church leadership. These three models of church leadership are so common and so familiar, they just seem normal to us. In fact, when somebody says to you, come lead, I'm guessing beyond the shadow of a doubt, one of these three has popped into your mind as the primary thing we're called to. Here, here's the problem. Two of those models are not biblical. They're cultural. We've borrowed them from around us, but they're not what Christ calls us to be. They're not what the church needs us to be. They're not what the kingdom will be advanced with. And so in this series, let's talk about what's that one model. In this session in particular, we're going to begin, though, with what are the two that are not biblical. Now, you know, when I begin to describe them and begin to call them by name or at least give them names, your mind's even probably going to wonder, well, what's wrong with that? That seems normal. That seems right. But it's not. The reality is the kingdom leadership stands distinct from these two. Here's the first one. The first model of leadership I'm going to call the storefront model. The storefront model of leadership. The storefront model of leadership you're going to see in a lot of different ways. Your local convenience store is a storefront model. Your, um, your convenience store has this pattern that plays out. Whether you owned it or you ran it or you hired me for it, uh, here's what you would want. You would want somebody who runs an activity that people want or an activity that people need, and you want them to be personable. Activity running and personable. So this, this local convenience store, uh, if I were a leader uh, for you, what would I do? Well, I, I stand behind a counter, and, and, and I run an activity, and, and you want me to take good care of people. 
Uh, who am I responsible for? I'm responsible for anybody one foot on the asphalt. Who am I not responsible for? Anybody one foot off the asphalt. The local hospital, it's a storefront model. Uh, the hospital in your area, I'm assuming is terrific. You let a guy my age show up and I go to your hospital and, and I begin to complain about my left side hurting or my arm or my neck. I'll tell you, a set of nurses will come out of those back rooms and they will grab me and put me on a gurney and take me back and, and they will run an activity that I really need, an important activity. They will even have a doctor who comes involved, and quite frankly, that doctor will be talked to every now and then about his bedside manners, because the activity and being personable, that's the key to it. Who are they responsible for at the hospital? Anybody one foot on the property. Who are they not responsible for? Anybody one foot off. Disney World. Disney World is a storefront model. What would happen at Disney World is, is you have a a massive gathering. This gathering is a funnel trying to get people to come. They'll use advertising, they'll use all kinds of things, word of mouth, they hope people have had good experiences, so they'll come back, but there's this funnel that is driving people to Disney World. And then what they'll do is they'll have an activity that they run. And what they do is they recruit leaders to run that activity. And so here's what you might happen. I would come on a bus, and when I show up, there's 50 of us or 45 of us, and we got off a bus, and a, and a little gal and a little guy who really like people that are personable, what they'll do is they'll meet us and get a little red or blue flag or something, and they'll take us and they'll run us through the activities, and it'll be an incredible day, and we really, really enjoyed them. And, and we will say to them as the day opens up and at the end of the day, and we scatter, and, and we go on our separate ways, you, you will say, wow, I, I wished I could stay in contact with that little guy or gal but you won't. It's not because that little guy or gal doesn't want to. It's not because they were hypocritical and didn't really like people and so they won't stay with you. That's not the problem at all. No, they're authentic. The problem is that the life they live is so overwhelmed by the activity they run and being personable with all the groups that their ability to be at your birthday party or to be at your anniversary or to come and have supper at your table, it just can't happen because they've got another bus pulling in and another bus pulling in and another bus pulling in. And this is so dominating. Running the activity is the primary accent mark of their leadership. Personable and activity. Something is wrong when the church is looking for the same people Disney World is looking for. And something is not right about advancing the kingdom when the primary thing we do is we find some way to gather people and run a, an important activity. But the primary investment of a leader is here. We'll talk more about why this doesn't work and why this isn't what Christ called us to. But I want us to just simply stick here. You would never get the impression that this is Jesus' kind of leadership by watching Jesus' life and seeing this. We've borrowed this from the culture. Kingdom leadership is not primarily running even great activities and being personable. This is not it. There's a second model that exists. The second model of leadership I'm going, to, I'm going to call it the Foreman model. The Foreman model of leadership, pretty simple. You see it all the time. Some 21, 22, 23-year-old kids hired by the local construction company, and he's a great kid. They give him an old beat-up pickup to drive around, and, 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 and it's got in the back of it a scoop shovel, and it's got all kinds of things that he's hauling off to the trash and the dump for them, and, and he's got a, it's a scoop shovel. He's, he, he picks up broken shingles and puts them in the back of the pickup to haul them off, and he's underneath houses pulling cables, and, and, and there's just no limit to the kind of grungy things he does. He's a, he's a grunt level. His girlfriend might even call him and say, hey, do you want to get together for supper tonight? And he says, yeah, it'd be great when I get off work, but I'll have to go home and shower first because I'm really, really dirty. But as that young man works for that company and they recognize he's a terrific young man and they want to move him more into leadership, here's what will happen. He will become cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. 
In fact, they will begin to issue him a new F-150, and he gets the, the one with the logo on the side, and he gets that white shirt that has the, the logo on it, and, 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 and he gets this, this hard hat with his name on it, and he gets a clipboard. And now his primary thing is not to get his hands dirty, not to be filthy. His hands, he is, what he does is he makes decisions. Decision making is his primary contribution. He makes good decisions and makes people happier. He makes good decisions and saves the company money. He makes good decisions as why they, as why they move him into leadership. His girlfriend might even call him and say, hey, do you want to meet for supper? And I, and I know you have to go shower. And he goes, nope. I'm as good as, as I was when I went to work today, and it's truth. Because he's in the new, with the clipboard, in the decision-making role. What happens in churches is an awful lot of individuals begin to believe that leadership is taking out of the congregation and raising up people who are the better decision-makers, people who can include people, people who can keep the finances well, people who can make sure the building's maintained, people who, who just make good decisions about personnel. And decision-making and running the operation, a bit more like the, the captain of a ship, that becomes what a leader is. I want to remind you that Jesus never once, never once took his disciples by a Roman rock quarry it would have been a marvel of technology. You talk about the physics involved, and you talk about an ability to coordinate people and make an effective operation. A Roman rock quarry would have been a, a marvel to watch. Jesus never once took his disciples by and said, see that guy in the white shirt, that guy with the clipboard, the guy with the white hat? I want you to watch him. I want you to model him. I want you to do what he does. I want you to be as efficient and effective as he is. That wasn't who Jesus ever pointed out. Jesus never once took his disciples by a, a Roman harbor. A harbor master would have been a brilliant individual. He would have known languages and tides and economy and nations and people. He, he would have been brilliant on his ability to coordinate activities. Jesus never once pointed out a harbor master and said, I want you to be like him. In fact, if Jesus did anything, you're going to find it in passages like Mark chapter 10. When Jesus says, those rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over their subjects. And those who regard it as leaders, they exercise authority over their subjects. But not you. If you're going to be great in the kingdom, you're going to be a servant. Years ago, I remember a, a man in our congregation, he had been there a year or two. He jumped into the congregation and, and become active. He was running activities, so to speak, in our youth area, and, and he was running activities and doing things and, 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 and being involved with, with uh, missions and so forth. And, and I know it had some humor in it, so please don't, don't, don't hear just a... a uh, a comment about, of negative about him. But he came in one day and he said, I, I'd like to become more of a leader here. I asked him, what do you mean by that? He winked and he said, I want to come back in that smoke-filled room where everybody is smoking the stogies and the room is filled with smoke and we're making decisions. Well, what he meant by that was he believed that the model of leadership was you may start here on running decision, or running things and doing activities, but in his view, you move to the decision-making side where you're somebody who's in charge of the operation. The church is not built by that. These two things, yes, we'll be involved in. Every leader will have to do a little of this and need to do a little, but that, that's not leadership. It is, no, it needs to come off the page. That's, that's not leadership. And yes, we'll even have to make some decisions, but that is so sidelined and so little a part of, of being a kingdom leader that it's so distracting. This would be a little bit like saying, you know what the secret to being a father is? Run your kids to activities and, and, and be sure and keep the checkbook balanced. 
those are a million miles of what it means, away from what it means to be father. The call to be a leader is something different entirely than these two things. These two things we have picked up from people who do not know the heart of Christ. Kingdom leadership involves a different call. In the next session, we'll pick up this call to kingdom leadership.